Hello and welcome to the Business of Data podcast brought to you by Corinium for the very first time live at CDO UK. That's the reaction we wanted. Now today we're going to be talking about data in science, which I had to get right, not data science, data in science. And to do just that, on the stage with me is the wonderful Karen Ambrose, who's the Research Data Services Team Lead for the Francis Crick Institute. Now, if you haven't met Karen yet in the networking space, just a few intro facts to get you up to speed. Karen has been with the Francis Crick Institute for the last eight years. Prior to that, was with Welcome Sanger Institute. Now, if you can't find her at a work desk or not in the networking area, then you will find her building Lego houses. Karen, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for that intro. <laughs> you are welcome. So, I mean, Lego is awesome. Um, I love the wellness around Lego as well, yes. like the mindfulness around it. What was the last thing you made? Um, well, I made, um, I've got an architectural skyline of New York, so I made that. But the last thing I bought was the um, Bugatti Chiron. So that's pending for Easter to be built that's at, this, at this point. How many hours is that going to take you? I don't know, I think maybe a couple of days, I think, in, in, a, in, in reality. But it's, it's a beautiful box of twisted all the way. Everything. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> I love I'll put that. put myself away in terms of geek of geekdom. Oh, no, you're, you're in the right space. <laughs> who, who here also likes Lego? Who doesn't like Lego? Yeah. Yes, very, very valid point. I love that, absolutely. And there, there is some really, really cool sets. As I said, yeah. the mindfulness behind it, but I also think it's, it's very strategic. I, my other half's into Lego, I'm not. I will, I'll put it out there. Um, but the amount of instructions and stuff. I think yeah. that, I, you say nerdy, but I think it leads into the data community a bit, the get, getting involved there. But uh, let, let's part the Lego conversation, otherwise this podcast is going to go well, wildly <laughs> off, off course. Um, for the benefit of our audience, for the benefit of our listeners, Talk me through what your organisation is all about. So, um, for those of you who don't know, the um, Francis Crick Institute is um, a biomedical science institute. So, it's one of the largest um, in Europe um, biomedical institutes under one, one roof, essentially. So, we currently have about 1,500 scientists with support staff um, working towards the um, sort of the fundamental biology of disease and health at this stage. So, we work on various aspects of HIV, malaria, um, COVID-19, which was a recent one, but very at various aspects of disease and looking at sort of that, the process of how mm -hmm. disease kind of develops and cancer is, is a major project field as well. Yeah, so lots of interesting data oh, yes. within that as well. well. We'll dive into that in a moment. So that's the organisation. Let's go down then into your role. What does that look like day to day? So as the research data services team lead, I mainly am responsible for scientific databases and data with, which is generated across the teams within the Crick itself. So that's anything from supporting the science groups um, in terms of their pipeline, their scientific development, but also how they actually manage data within this, the institute as well from, from a science perspective. What things would help to sort of develop and propel science forward? Wow. So just just a little bit of the day role then, you yeah, know, just, 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 sorry, I'm not too busy. Well, let's unpack that then. So, so day to day, what are the big challenges that you're, you're working through? The, the, the old question of what keeps you up at night? Volume of data that's generated. I mean, um, we have various different streams of data, anything from image data, genomics, your basic um, spreadsheets, and, you know, text data, anything like that, that's generated from instruments that we have internally in the institute. And um, these data sets can be quite large as well in terms of sample, the outputs that they're producing. So in general, from a data perspective, we have, we have things like probably up to about 12 petabytes of data at the moment that we're dealing with. And that will only grow. Mm -hmm. you know, because as they get new instruments in, that just goes that an order of magnitude up in terms of the data output as well. Yeah. Yeah, so many organisations here, I'm sure, will will share the same uh, pain point of, of just the sheer volume of data. Now, the, the question I have for you is, are you collecting it because you can or because you need to? A bit of both, I think. Mm -hmm. So from a science, um, science has always been quite conservative in terms of the, in terms of getting rid of data. So from a scientist's perspective, it's like, collect it all and we'll see what we need at a later date. 
it's not a case of at this point making a decision, okay, what data do we actually need? I think now we're getting to a situation where we can't continually start building on that data mountain, if you like. And we have to change the conversation about, okay, what is it from what do we, we're just generating data to what do we actually need and what actually um, con contributes to the science, the, the development of science going forward as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, as you say, it's the, the capabilities we have nowadays means you can really enable that collection yeah. as well. So you have to put that in as a, as a barrier rather than the technology and the processes yeah. saying you can't collect it. There's a case of where you can, there's always more storage, there's always more space. So it's a case of you putting that into your process. In terms of culture, how does that sit with the science community? If you're saying, well, do you really need this? Is, is that what you, you need to be successful? Yeah, well, it's a conversation you have to have. It's very much a collaborative conversation because from their perspective, they know their domain and they know what they need. But from our perspective, from a technology, we know how much they're generating and what we, and what we need to store. So it's kind of looking at them and say, talking to them and saying, okay, what is your process? What is your data life cycle? What are you actually actively using when you actually look at the process that you're working through? Which bits are actually important? Which bits can we remove from that process? Because we actually, this is our main sort of common denominator that we can move forward from. And it's kind of, as I said before, it's kind of changing that conversation and saying that, okay, we're not just gonna keep all data because you're, you're conservative about the fact that you might need it, but it's actually thinking about what is it you're using it for. Mm. Mm. Now, as an industry, you can't keep the data forever, though, mm. can you? Because it is a case of collecting it all, and you have this mountain, but that mountain can't live forever. The, and you know, there'll be organisations in the room today, and organisations listening that are in the same similar yeah. space, especially when it comes to that uh, PII data that they've got to, you know, get rid of it at some point. Uh, how does that impact you? So, for our institute, we tend to steer away from patient identifiable, identifiable data because that in itself has another level of complexity in terms of storage, access, and what you actually can do with that data. But in terms of the data we do generate, we have um, certain rules about, okay, we have to keep the data for 10 years, and we, but it's kind of having that continual look, view of what that data is looking at, how it's being used, and how we can kind of change what, what we're keeping in that mm -hmm. realm. That's answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. So many organisations will have experienced the general public, patients, customers, however you want to frame them with, with uh, how you work. The, the lay understanding of data is increasing, which I think we can all agree is probably a good thing. Ethically, it's good that people are asking more questions, mm -hmm. that they understand where their data might be used, where it's going to go. Uh, if I sign up to that email, I'm going to get bombarded yeah. by 700 more. Um, and all the rest. How does that impact you and your role when it comes to consenting to that data use? And are you are they, are they asking more questions than ever? Is it a case that you're finding you're having to give more information about where it's going to be stored, how it's going to be used, how long it's going to be kept for? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, from a patient's perspective, that has to be taken very seriously because people are donating their data for scientific research, but they're donating under a knowledge of this is how it's going to be used. So you have to kind of honour the fact that they've gifted you that information and you have to make sure that it's kept safe, you're, you're, it's not being, you know, you don't have any data, any um, opportunity for data breach and it's used for that specific use case as well. So that, in effect for us, is, is quite an important thing we take quite seriously. Now, going, in terms of people asking um, information about the data, it's more on the results side. So when they've been involved in a, a study, it's kind of like, okay, can we release the results? Or what, what, did, what did my data sort of um, result, what did we learn from that? So it's kind of that, those kind of questions. But from um, the science groups, the science group's perspective, when they're, be, when they're involved in projects, there's from the funding bodies themselves, so those people that give us our, our sort of charitable money as well, there are stipulations around how data is managed as well and that we're keeping those, having a certain level of governance around that and we're sort of managing that effectively as well. So that is actually taken quite seriously from the funding bodies as well through the sort of the authoritative um, legal entities, if you like. Yeah, yeah, so you've got a, a lot of data and then governing that and making yeah. sure that, you know, quite rightly, uh, it's a very potentially very sensitive topic that these people are giving very sensitive uh, data to. And of course, they 
uh, will want to know the journey that their data has been on, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to tell them that journey and, yeah. and understand that. Because now, as well with GDPR, GDPR, whatever, right? But they have people have the um, right to ask, you know, what for their data and how it's being used as well. So we have to make sure that we're understanding that where that data is, sort of the 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 life cycle and sort of the links of how what, what systems it's been linked into. Mm. Well, let's take that then as, as kind of a, a use case. So, so say, for example, you, you've got uh, an ongoing project and data is being uh, collected. At what stage is that data being fairly uh, unstructured? Because I know that the, on the vast point that that is the, the scenario for you. What's the journey that data is, is taking? So when it comes, when the data is coming in, so we generally get our patient information from sort of central, re central repositories, if you like. So at that point, it's more or less structured. But internally, when we're doing our studies, our experiments, that kind of thing, a lot of that data, that, depending on where the source of that information is, can be unstructured. So it's, it comes in various different forms, I think. So it's kind of a, OK, how do we manage the data that's coming from a certain system? Um, system? How can we extract the um, value out of that, and which will be different from if it's coming from a particular instrument and it's structured in such a way that we know the format and we can we have tools to be able to extract that information. Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to structured versus unstructured, I feel like unstructured data gets a bit of a bad rap for being a negative thing, but I think there are many pros to it as well as cons. For you, what are the pros of having that kind of more unstructured nature to, nature to it? So you can probably store a hell of a lot more information. It means that you've got to do more work to extract the value from it, but it's, it gives you more flexibility in terms of the data that you're actually sort of storing or extracting from that. So th I think there's a lot more maybe value in, in that that could be extracted from that. Yeah, and value being such a key word. We've uh, heard so much on the stage here at CDO UK, certainly something that the listeners of our, of our podcast will have uh, listened to us talk about uh, so much. For you, when it comes to value in that data, what are the top things that you're looking to, to extract from that in terms of value? So from a science perspective, it's whether it can give us insights into the, the science research that we're doing. Is there something in there that can sort of say, okay, this is the direction in which we need to go in terms of this research and, and, and this study. Because um, you kind of start off in science as, as, a, as you all know from a hypothesis, or probably an idea, and then you test that idea and that hypothesis, but then the outcome may take you in a different direction. And it's wondering whether the data we have can actually predict or help to direct that as well. Yeah. So you started off at the top of the conversation talking about the, the organization and the various kind of people that are going to be involved in this from the scientists through to, to the data team. Now I'm seeing a lot of data needing to be very obviously strictly governed. What does that access look like to get the data for the people to get the data that they need to do their jobs? So we have to kind of balance it between being secure, <laughs> The, you know, and managing the access, but not getting in the way of the, uh, how science develops as well. So again, it's a, con it's a, it's a um, conversation with the groups at large, of their understanding what we're trying to achieve and our understanding of what they're trying to achieve, and working out, okay, what is the middle ground in terms of, okay, we're restricting access on the, at a group level, but in terms of how we, they may want to use that data for collaboration. We have other services in place to be able to facilitate that. So it's, again, it's a conversation with them again, again, okay, this is what you want, but this is how we can facilitate what you want and still maintain the, the, the security of the data as well. Yeah. And we work very closely with our security teams and everything and, and in that respect to make sure that we're, we've got all the bases covered and we're understanding the, the sort of the impact of that. Are you wanting to meet with other senior executives in the data and analytics space? In an environment that is created for connection and inspiration? Then why not join one of our in-person conferences? We have events all over the world, and you can find out the ones closest to you by visiting careniumintelligence.com slash events. Yeah, that sweet spot in the middle, yeah. as you say, because you can't lock everything down because nothing yeah. will get done, and that's not particularly uh, helpful yeah, either. Yeah, we'll to... scientists sort of shouting at us saying, just, just release the data, please. Yeah. When it comes to positioning yourself, would you say that perhaps you have an easier job when it comes to this kind of collaborative effort 
given that I feel, and you know, you tell me if, if I'm wrong here, I feel the science community are probably quite data culture anyway, and maybe mm. they're bought into that journey a bit more than perhaps some of the people sat in the room here from organizations where they're really having to sell that data culture to, to be able to do these types of things when it comes to governing and access. And is there more understanding there? There is, but they're, um, they're more fr from a static perspective of, of the data is generated. Here it is. Yes, wh why would we not lock it down in that respect? It's, but they're, we're kind of trying to change the conversation, saying, OK, can we do more with the data internally to facilitate the work that they're doing at the moment? So are there insights into that science? Is there an another way of kind of extracting insights and value from that science data to actually inform the wider science that's going on in the Institute. Yes, lots of pressure then to, yeah. to be on it. Wonderful. Now, <laughs> conversations we've had uh, in the past, it's very clear to me um, from, from chatting to, to some of your colleagues, to, to chatting with yourself, uh, that there's people from all sorts of backgrounds mm -hmm. involved in, in the curriculum. We're talking here about collaboration. Do you think that having people from, from all sorts of uh, areas is, is benefiting you in, in what you're, you're doing and, and the work you're doing? Yeah, definitely. So the CRIC itself is um, a multinational institute. So basically, we probably have people from 70 different cultures in the, in the building. So you could imagine there's all various different experiences and people bringing their ideas, which actually is quite um, rich in, in, in the discussion because people bring their different perspectives from their respective backgrounds and you kind of think, well, actually, I didn't think of that that way. And you start to kind of open up the conversation more. So I think that has actually been a real plus in terms of how the Institute operates. Mm -hmm. As you say, uh, bringing to the table different perspectives, yeah. uh, something that, that we all want. And I know from conversations I've had uh, conducting different interviews, it's certainly uh, something that's going to be very much front of mind. If it's not already, it's going to be in the next uh, 12 months or so for, for many people. And I think it's fair to say that not all organizations are as blessed with uh, said diversity. So what do you think the curriculum has got so right to, to be in this situation? Obviously, I'm assuming there's been practical things. It doesn't just happen as we know. So what, what have you been doing well to, to land up in this collaborative state where you have lots of people uh, joining uh, from, from all over? So I think um, from my perspective, I've, as well as my day job, I'm very much involved in the EDI part of the Institute as well and looking at how we can increase diversity in science in general. So, but I think from an Institute perspective, they're very open to the conversation. So they've already put in place various initiatives around protective characteristics and making sure that we're highlighting we address those the, the aspects of the institute that may be in, impacting particular groups, but also bringing people into that conversation, looking at activities or initiatives that we need to do to kind of increase that, that um, visibility in a, in a wider scope and encourage other people to kind of come get involved in science or come or think of the CRIC as a, as a potential employer or place that they can work as well. So it's kind of making it not so much of a scary building. And I don't know if, you, if you've been, the location of the building is basically next to St. Pancras Station, just across the road, sort of just behind the British Library. So it can be, it's quite a big building, so it can be a little bit intimidating to look at, but it's kind of getting people to come in and sort of um, not be intimidated, but think about, okay, this could be quite an exciting place to work. Yeah, uh, I've um, interviewed and chatted. In fact, on the Business of InfoSec podcast, we've uh, chatted with uh, Guy Morrill, who's your Chief of Information Security mm. Officer. And it's really interesting, that conversation about the building came up there as well, of how to make a building seem inviting, but also be secure as yeah. well. So uh, the building clearly a, a, a hot topic for, for you all, of how to, to make it welcoming for, for everyone. So over the next 12 months, for you, on the topic of data in science, what are you going to be thinking about? What's going to be the, the hot topics uh, for you? So for me, it's, so we've, in the last two years, we've spent, not my group directly, but we've spent time in, in sort of bringing um, to life the operational data and value from that. And what I want to do is sort of extend that out to science data and seeing how we can um, extract the, the value and present that back to the science from that perspective as well. Um, It'll be a different viewpoint, I think, because from an operational perspective, it's very, it feels very straightforward and standard. You know, you've got your metrics, your publications, that kind of thing. But from a science, the question is different in terms of what they want to know. 
So the who, what, why, where is kind of, okay, there's a starting point, but it's more about, okay, what proteins, the science output, does that have a relation back to another group that's potentially doing research in this area? How can we link those things a bit closer? And maybe the failures as well are very as important as the, as the sort of successes in terms of identifying areas where people don't need to go down and they can skip that step and say, actually, this, that might not um, be, um, because it's failed for something else, it might not be good for this thing, but we can then progress things at a faster pace in that mm -hmm. respect. So that will be my focus to kind of develop that going forward, I think. A very exciting focus indeed. Yes. Now, you've been uh, at CDO UK here for, for a couple of days, uh, in, enjoying all the sessions, I do hope. For you, what have been your key takeaways? What's, what's, what have you really drawn out from this event for you? So for me, um, I've been to a lot of the presentations and picked up a lot of um, tips around putting together data strategies and what the kind of things need to consider. I was very kind of encouraged by various different presenters talking about the data champions and data stewards and the fact that they actually play an important part in making sure that you get the education out there and you're able to get your staff to actually sort of um, add extra weight to your, your data um, direction as well, because that's quite important to get that knowledge and that collaboration in place. So I thought that was a real key message. Wonderful. Now, the last question I end every single podcast episode on is, as our listeners go about the rest of the day and uh, for our audience here as they uh, go into their next session, what is the one or two key things you really want them to be thinking about leaving this episode? Sort of the, um, oh God, <laughs> I've got me on the stop. But um, probably the, the exciting aspects of science and how that actually can add extra dimensions to the data that where the data work that we're going and, and, and kick it up an extra step, I think. That would be the possibilities, I think. Wonderful. Karen, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.